Tim is the, uh, one of the founders of Draper Fisher Jurvetson. Uh, he's been ranked number seven on the Forbes Midas list. Um, he's probably best known for his antics, like um, singing the song Risk Master at, uh, <laughs> at any request. Uh, he currently sits on the boards of, uh, is it Do At? Do At, uh, Glam, which is a big one, Mebo, Prosper, Social Text. Uh, he's been in the industry forever. Uh, he's also credited with creating um, the concept of viral marking, and people use the word viral, it's because of Tim. So uh, please help me welcome uh, Tim Draper. Thanks very much, Larry. Is there a clicker or something? Ah, this. I think next would be the way to do the next thing. Um, terrific. Um, do I have to stay behind this thing, or can I be out? OK, OK. Um, great, thanks. I guess I'm the last speaker, so um, I appreciate you guys for just hanging out so long. Um, I wanted to. Uh, to do a few things today, and then, uh, then I will open it up for questions. First, I always do a pre-roll. Buy this book. My dad wrote it. Um, he, it's about the relationship between the venture capitalist and the entrepreneur, and it's a great, uh, it's a great spiritual, ex it's a great experience to kind of go through spiritually because he's such a positive guy. Um, we. Uh, this is what is called genetic dilution. Uh, <laughs> my grandfather was the first venture capitalist uh, on the West Coast. And, uh, and then uh, my dad helped really uh, design the industry. And, uh, and so all I've done is really just take advantage of all the work that the two of them have done. Uh, and, and dad was actually the, also the first investor in India. Uh, first venture investor in India and uh, has really uh, pioneered a lot of the work. So I'll start with India. Um, I, I want to take you a little bit around the world because that's kind of what I've been, been doing with my career. Uh, I have this mission of spreading venture capital and entrepreneurship around the world. And, uh, and my experience with, with India started in the US, I had these two young guys, 26 years old, and they came to me and they said, we can do web-based email. And I thought, OK, let me think about what that is. Email, OK, I think that's that thing some of these scientists are using to communicate. Web, I, I think that was the internet. I think that's that internet thing. And it, it took me a while, and I finally figured out that was really interesting. And then they said, they said and we want to give it away free. And I thought, and then? And what do you do? You, well, well, they decided um, that they would give this away free. And we decided we'd put a little bit of money behind them because we just thought that took a lot of gumption to say that they had no business model, but that they were going to um, give, give something away. And it was going to sp uh, spread. And I said, how are you going to spread this? And they said, well, well, we'll do TV ads. And we, we had given them like $130,000. I thought, well, how are you going to? Are you going to do TV ads with that? You'll get a microsecond on TV. And uh, they said, uh, well, we'll just have to raise more money. And I thought, God, I never want to raise more money. I want the company to figure it out themselves. I said, can't you just get it out to all those guys on that internet thing? And they said, they said no, no, we can't do that. Uh, that would be spamming. So new word for me. And I knew it was a bad thing because they said spamming. And I didn't particularly like that stuff that's in the jar, spam. And then they said, uh, and then I said, well, can't you just, I thought back on the Tupperware case I had in business school where the, the customers became salespeople. And I said, why don't you just give it away? Uh, you're giving this thing away. Why don't you say, uh, and then I thought very cleverly, P.S. I love you. Get your free email at Hotmail at the bottom of every email, because then it would spread from me to you and from you to your friends and them to their friends. And, um, and I fought and fought and fought. And finally, the, the negotiation ended with, OK, but no P.S. I love you. But to this day, I think we would have a much more peaceful and loving world if they had kept with a PS I love you, because you know how many, there are 500 million or a billion users of Hotmail 
uh, over the course of history. Now, of course, there are other web-based email packages out there, but uh, that, was, uh, that was a great experience, and Hotmail became this great winner for us. Um, but uh, we have since set up uh, India office, and I went out there with my partner in India, and we, we, you know, I'm watching as the cow comes across, and the elephant, and the guy on the camel, and the, the guy in the rickshaw, and the motorcycle coming by, and the cars com coming by, and they're all seeming to go through this one intersection, and he looks at me, he goes, you ready to cross an Indian street? And I went, okay. <laughs> And so I kind of get halfway across as things are going past me in all different ways. And then I sprint to the other side. And he goes, no! And I say, what? I made it. And he goes, no sudden movements. So then I figured it out. In India, everyone is doing partial differential calculus as they cross the street. And that's why there are so many great software engineers from there. Um, in... Uh, this was a fun experience. I had just been to Ukraine where the president of Ukraine said, I said, I'll never invest in Ukraine. And he said, well, why? And I said, because it takes 26 bureaucrats and six months before you can even incorporate in Ukraine. And he said, that will be one bureaucrat, one week. And I said, well, we'll see. And it didn't really happen. But that guy was a, he was a wonderful uh, guy, he was the head of the Orange Revolution and has since been sort of thrown out of Ukraine, but um, because he had these ideas. Um, anyway, on the way to, uh, I was on my way to Estonia, and the reason I was going to Estonia was interesting. I had told my friend Tony Perkins that I would speak at his conference in Palo Alto, and then I was on the Skype board. At that time, Skype had a, you know, maybe a million users or whatever, and maybe four million, and uh, it was all audio. And he said, uh, and, I, and I said, Tony, I got bad news. The Skype board meeting's on the same day, at, and it's got to be in Estonia as your conference. And then we, we looked at each other, and I said, well, what if I did a video conference? And he said, um, yeah, I guess that'd be okay because video conference was like this back then. Um, and <laughs> and I, I said, but we'll, t we'll try it. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. And he said, hey, can you get that guy, Nicholas Zenstrom, to join you? And I said, yeah, yeah, sure. We'd be, that'd be great. We'll do that over a video conference. So I'm relieved. And then I'm, I tell Nicholas, and he says, oh, yeah, no problem. We can set up video conference here. I said, great. So I get... I get to the video conference booth area in, inside of the Skype headquarters, and, uh, and I said, okay, it's about time, and, and since this is video conferencing, we should have a telephone backup. And he said, well, uh, yeah, I guess. And, and then, uh, then he turns and he goes, okay, throw the switch. And I said, what? And he said, oh, we've been working on something in the back. Uh, we have sort of an alpha version of our video conference system, and we're going to use it. And I said, what? And I said, okay, here we go. And, um, and it was perfect. And I said, how did you do that? And he said, well, we cut off about 4 million telephone conversations so that we could get <laughs> enough bandwidth so that we could send you the video conference. So anyway, that was my Estonian story. Uh, and, and Skype, of course, was a great success for us. We uh, were big fans of Nicholas and, and Giannis and all the things that they, all the great things they've been doing since. Um, so now I'll take you to China. My dad took me to China <clears throat> when I was 24 years old or something, and that was 30 years ago, um, 29 years ago. And uh, he said, come, uh, come with me to China. I said, okay, great. We, we flew in, we got in the only car, and went on the only paved road to the only Americanized hotel in all of China, and uh, in all of Beijing. And uh, everyone was on bicycles, and it was a, it was a very, very different place. And, uh, and we had a great time. And then flash forward about 15 years, and I'm back in China, and I went to just check it out and see what kind of progress the country had made. 
And, uh, <clears throat> and I went from uh, Shanghai to Hangzhou. It was about a three hour drive at that time. It's a little less now. And I was looking out the window and I saw all these two story concrete tilt ups. Everybody lived in the exact same kind of a place. And then I saw one with blue windows and a spire. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Went a little farther. Another one, blue windows and a spire. And then I saw a full block of blue windows and spires and a nice driveway that was connecting them all. And I thought, oh, wow, this is the beginning. First, I thought the blue window salesman's going to make a fortune. <laughs> and then I thought, the, the, uh, this is like keeping up with the Joneses. They're going to have, you know, if, the, if one guy has a refrigerator, the next guy's got to have a refrigerator. If one guy ha has a, a stove top, another guy has to have a stove top. If some guy has a cell phone, another guy has to have a cell phone. So it's just going to spread. And I checked with an entrepreneur who had uh, sold chocolate in China, and, and he said, yeah, I built a $90 million chocolate company in China, and it got nationalized. So I spoke with a minister in China, and I said, what? Why would I ever invest in your country? You're just going to nationalize my, my company. And, uh, and he, he looked at me, hmm, hmm, interesting. And I said, he said, what would you suggest to get more capital into China? And I said, let people make money. He said, hmm, hmm. And that was all I got from him. But it turned out. Um, <laughs> He did let people make money. We all did very well who invested in China during that period. Um, but my first three investments in China were to companies where the entrepreneur came to me and said, I have very good government connections. And I said, government connections, OK, that must be important in China. And we lost our money in those three companies. And then I thought, well, what do we do? I didn't want to give up yet. What do we really do? Well, we back these young guys, and we hope that something really interesting happens over time. Uh, and they've got to have this energy and this feeling like they can take over the world. And uh, so then we started to do that. And one guy I negotiated a deal with in um, China was uh, creating a search engine. Uh, my partner, John Fisher, had brought the, the deal in, but I was in China at the I, I went to China, and I checked it out, and we negotiated a deal. And then we told, I talked to him about all the business models the various search engines had had in the US. And he got very excited about that. And it turned out uh, that that company became Baidu. And uh, we, I was, I, it was very crazy, because I thought, boy, we really going to put $9 million into this thing for 28% of it or something? And, and uh, we finally did, and uh, Baidu is now worth 50 billion, something like that, 45, 50 billion. So um, that really, that China thing really worked out. So um, this is a little bit about DFJ. Um, we have, in going out, uh, it all started with Hotmail, and I realized that geographic borders were going to fall, and entrepreneurship could be anywhere. And there were, you know, there were, what, 5 million people around the Silicon Valley, but there were about 7 billion people around the world who could all be great uh, entrepreneurs someday. And I thought, boy, that's, pretty, um, that's a pretty big goal to go after. And I thought, well, how can I do this? And so we, we set up, in effect, this network. It was a network of venture capital firms um, that started small, just a few, uh, few locations. And then it grew and grew and grew. And now we have about 30 different cities covered by our DFJ global network. And that has really helped us over the last um, <clears throat> whatever it's been, 10 years. Um, but something interesting is happening now. <clears throat> all of those people are now on to the joke. They all get it. They all uh, know how entrepreneurship works. They know how venture capital works. And <clears throat> the other thing is that through viral marketing or, uh, and social networking and various other um, innovations in technology, um, digital global distribution is commoditizing. And so that means that anybody with a new interesting idea can immediately shoot it up into the web 
and it can be spread very quickly all the way around the world. And, uh, and that made me feel like, okay, well maybe my, my uh, Johnny Appleseed job is complete because, well, there's still Africa and there's some of South America that we haven't really covered, but, um, but now it's really about where is the best technology and where are the best things because um, the technological breakthroughs are going to spread faster. They're going to happen from a lot of other, a lot of other great locations. And uh, so, uh, so I'm thinking that it might be good for us to uh, continue to build out our network, but also to realize that Silicon Valley is a, a major center of creativity and to focus very hard there. And um, because it is going to um, be, and, and Silicon Valley is, does seem to be the cutting edge. Now, there are also cutting edges in China. I've seen some very interesting things in Singapore, Korea, um, <coughs> Eastern Europe. There are actually some real breakthroughs. I think they used Skype as their model and uh, some great things happened. But I think the Silicon Valley is going to have a resurgence. <laughs> Here's the other thing that's happening, and you can't really see this except that um, uh, change is continuing faster and faster. So what that means to me um, as an investor is that I need to be fleet of foot. I need to be able to move quickly. Um, this is uh, Moore's Law, and it shows that $1,000 worth of compute power doubles every 18 months. So, um, but now it's like every 14 months. It's even accelerating beyond what Moore had envisioned. And if, that's, if that continues to be the case, there's a new platform that's twice as good almost every year. And when there's a new platform, there's a whole new rash of creativity, software, internet applications that goes off of that. So, uh, so the companies, I think, are going to have, they, they run through that S-curve uh, where they, they innovate for a while and then they, the market starts to take off and then they plateau when they've reached most of their customer base. Um, that S-curve is going to happen faster and faster and faster. And so uh, uh, we in the venture capital business think that that's great for venture capital because it is going to... Uh, take advantage of, the, of, those, uh, of those faster and faster curves. We do have a liquidity problem, and that is um, a lot of that has to do with regulation, but, um, but it turns out by being global, we also are global in the way we look at liquidity, and there are other markets outside of the U.S. that have uh, easier ways to get liquidity. And, uh, and in addition to that, um, I got very frustrated, and so I actually started a company called Expert Financial that um, allows companies to list without being public. And uh, we think that that's sort of going to be the, new, the next new wave, and it'll be great liquidity so that entrepreneurs can get started and they can do just what they used to do, which is work very, very hard for five to seven years and get to be 20 or 30, 50 million in revenues, and then they can list. Now, it's not until they're worth a billion dollars that they can list on NASDAQ now, but, uh, but there's that interim place where it's going to really help, I think. Uh, these are just DFJ's guiding principles. Uh, we focus on these extraordinary uh, individuals, but they've got to be going after very big markets. They've got to have clearly defined business models although Hotmail really didn't at the time, but at least a direction to a great business model. Um, we look for unique technologies. And then uh, low capital requirements, but, um, and, and then we look for opportunities created by lazy bureaucratic incumbents. <laughs> it's one of our scenes. But, um, but the low capital requirements um, makes me re remember that we also have a rule that there are no there are no hard and fast rules to investing in venture capital. Um, this is something I call the Draper wave, because <laughs> for no better, no better name. Um, it, started, it started back when my grandpa was starting in the venture business back in, say, 1957. And I don't know what happened during that time, but I'm assuming it, it did just what 
uh, the rest of these waves do. These waves are not a sine wave. When people say cyclical, they always think a sine wave. But it's, this is more of a shark's tooth. And there's nothing ironic about venture capital and private equity being part of a shark thing. But, um, in, uh, but let's go, in 1968 to 74, there was this merger mania. And people bought up companies, and then they cut them in half, and then they'd cut all of, half the workforce, and then they'd grow that way. They'd just buy up companies and cut half the workforce and continue to grow that way. And these big conglomerates happened, and they got big, and, uh, and, and then they, they were just buying up everything and got kind of crazy. And then that came <clears throat> barreling down, and we had a recession in 73, 74. And then when you have a recession, people are out of work. So they start new businesses. And when they start new businesses, uh, the venture guys, the angels, whoever, just help start them, help get them going. And then little at a time, things get better and better and better. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and then it goes to a crescendo where everybody's investing in these things. And, and uh, in 1983, Arthur Rock and Steve Jobs were on the cover of Time magazine. And then that came crashing down, and that was about when I entered the venture capital business. And <clears throat> then there was another run of the PE business. They called themselves LBOs then, and they did all these buyouts. And they, um, and they did a few because uh, companies were getting too sloppy. And, then, and they were working out, and so more investors came in, and more banks came in, and then they were just throwing money at just whatever. And RJR Nabisco got into this crazy, huge LBO, and that was the, the top of the business in 1991. And then it came crashing down. And then, of course, there's always a scapegoat. Michael Milken was the scapegoat. And we had another recession. And then the venture business started to pick up because the entrepreneurs had to go out there and start businesses because people had lost their jobs. And the cycle began again. We had a big boom in venture capital. We had the bubble at the top in 2000, 2001, came crashing down, and then the PE business came back in, made, made everything more efficient, and, uh, and uh, then it kind of got into this frenzy again where it got over levered, and we have another crash and another recession in 2008. And now, I, I, I created this thing in 2008, but it's, now it's actually happening uh, that it looks like it's our time again. Um, the IPO window is returning since 2008, and the M&A activity is rebounding since 2008. So the environment is um, trending up, and it looks like we're starting another one of those eight to 10 year cycles. We go after problem solvers, people who are looking at, if you see a politician saying, we have a medical problem, or we have a traffic problem or we have a whatever problem. Entrepreneurs are the ones who go after that and then they go and they solve it. Um, there, are, there is a big uh, disruptive wave coming and there always is. And there's more and more change happening faster and faster. And so here you've got ubiquitous connectivity and then you put that together with smart devices and a cloud in infrastructure and there's going to be more disruption. And we, our worlds are going to change more and more and more and faster and faster and faster. Um, you know, we're seeing things in what's now called big data, but, but it's, um, it's predictive analytics. Uh, by looking at data, you can predict the future. And um, uh, it's things like uh, if you're if you like Kesha and you looked at an, a site for cheap earrings, you're probably like 19-year-old girl and you're going to like Hunger Games. It's that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and then the other things that are happening are uh, in, the, uh, in the social networking space. Uh, there's, there's Facebook sort of for everybody, and then it's being segmented down into Path, which is just for your s small group of friends, and then something called, uh, oh God, uh, anyway, it, it's got, it's, it's just for you and your spouse, and you can kiss each other by putting your thumb up against your cell phone and it vibrates, <laughs> kind of fun. 
And then we look for iconoclasts. We look for people who are taking on things that you never thought would ever change. I never thought the post office would be anything different, but then there was Hotmail. I never thought telecom would be anything but Ma Bell with the dial-up phone, and, uh, and then Skype came along. That kind of thing, the neighborhood completely has been obliterated by social networking. People, uh, kids don't go next door. They sit there on their computer and they're talking to somebody in Sri Lanka. We also look for clever business models, and the best example of this is Amazon, because Amazon created a bookstore with infinite inventory that they didn't have to pay for, and they had zero accounts receivable. So we look for zeros in that balance sheet and income statement, other than in cash and sales and profits. Um, and then we look for black swans, which is a hard thing to look for, but we're out there spreading as far and wide as we possibly can. We speak, we go on the press, and we hope that these black swans eventually find us. And uh, uh, so that's, that's kind of uh, what we do. And the black swans don't necessarily fit our model. And here are four great companies that are not, uh, that are capital intensive, and we still invested, and they still are working out quite well. Solar City um, is, installs solar panels in California. Um, SpaceX can actually launch a space vehicle for one one hundredth of the cost that NASA could launch the exact same space vehicle. Um, and so NASA is, has subbed this out. Uh, Tesla created a car that's all electric that can go much faster, much uh, quicker, and much cheaper than anything uh, out there on the road. It goes zero to 60 in 3.4 seconds, which uh, beats anything gas-powered other than, uh, you know, like a, a, a uh, some, where they, they strap a rocket to your back and you go. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and then in, in Radiance is a precision manufacturing company. They use lasers with short pulses and they can cut very carefully, and it's being used in uh, some of the devices, some of the cars, uh, it's being used all over. And, uh, and so we actually do, we're always going for low capital intensive companies, except when we see something that might be a black swan. This is DFJ, this is kind of our, our future. Uh, we're we're going to use the network and the core, core as a base, and then we're going to be launching uh, and this is so our investors can sort of have a, ha have a little bit of a Chinese menu, uh, whether they invest in the seed, the early, or the growth stage of venture capital. Um, and you can balance, we assume investors are going to take all of it, but uh, you can balance your portfolio or whatever. And, uh, and we have found that various partners have more of a proclivity for different areas here. And so we're, um, we're launching off in that direction. So with that, I have some time for questions, and thank you very much. <clears throat> and no, I don't think you're going to sing to this particular group. <laughs> uh, Tim, so you mentioned that a lot of LPs, a lot of LPs, a lot of LPs got out of the business. You're slowly starting to look at it again. What would you say to that? What would you, uh, what sort of advice would you give them? Um, they should look for DFJ because <laughs> over the next two or three years, we always we will have a series of funds. Oh, the question was, what should LPs be looking for now that they're starting to put their toe back in the water for venture capital? They've had 10 years of very bad returns in venture capital. What, what is it um, now? What should they do? And I said, well, invest with DFJ. But... Um, but the, um, the reasoning is, I mean, we do, we do have 27 years as a partnership. Um, we've got a lot of good experience. We've been pounding the pavement for a long time. We have connections all over the world. We have a huge deal flow. So that's what I'd look for is something like that. <laughs> A 
few more questions from the crowd. Yeah. Different. How are lives going to be different five, ten years from now because of what you're doing at DFJ? Well, this is a great question. What's my vision of the future based on uh, what we're doing at DFJ and that, that kind of thing? Um, my vision is very, it, it's, um, in, I, I have a couple of different visions, but let's say, let's start with the financial world. In the financial world, I do see um, liquidity coming back. And I think it will, I think investments will, will have a shorter holding period because of companies like Expert um, and a few others that I've seen come along, Boost Funding and, and a few others where they're focused on improving liquidity for the company, not for the investors, but for the company. And, uh, and so I think, I think venture, uh, venture capital will be more of, uh, an art form again rather than um, just like right now it's just fighting in the dirt. And, and then I, I do think that the PE business is going to have a flat line for a while, uh, the leverage business, because it's just a very difficult time to raise, uh, to raise bank financing. And companies are pretty efficient now and their job is really to make companies more efficient. So. Um, so I'll start with, that's starting with the financial world. Okay, in the engineering world, um, boy, I can see, first of all, we're going to have all the things that Star Trek predicted. We're going to have a holodeck. Uh, we're going to be able to sort of have a complete video history of everything around us. Uh, we're going to uh, be able to communicate very quickly, just boom, and, and uh, hey, I want to talk to George, you know, the whole gang. Um, we are, um, our, um, our worlds will change. We will have to adapt to new devices, new software, new internet things faster and faster because otherwise we'll be um, beaten by our competition. Uh, I, um, you know, if you think about Moore's Law, that means that the next 15 years will have as many innovations in, as there were in, say, the last 150 years. And that means that it's like, think of how our worlds have changed. Indoor plumbing, electricity, the internet, cell phones, these have all changed our lives in a big way. The next 15 years will change our lives as much as those last 150 have. So, uh, so I, I'm actually looking for entrepreneurs who are even more a little bit out there than the ones I've funded in the past. Because if you're just innovating in like a slightly better social network, um, it's too late because there are too many other people trying to do the same thing. But if you are trying to create you know, a new flying saucer, then I, I will sit for an hour and listen to you. <laughs> so I, I, see, um, I see a very great future. And I also see, OK, now my other future I'm looking at is governmental. And that is geographic borders are going to fall. People are going to be, it's going to be easier for people to move from place to place. And so countries are going to have to turn from buyers to sellers. They're going to have to convince great minds and capital and markets to come to their country. And so, uh, so governments now have to compete with one another for better environment for business. So there are my three sort of big picture visions. And then, of course, you know, we'll be able to just say, I'm hungry, food, drop. And it'll just show up in your hands. <coughs> yeah. Education and then how that might change, because with all this rapid development, we're going to need to learn more quickly. So how do you see the education and learning <coughs> Uh, go for it. Yeah, you, you hit a very hot button for me. Education is his issue, and what, what, why isn't that changing? We've, you know, we've changed everything else. Why is education actually backsliding? Um, I have one very clear uh, message there, and that is we, uh, and we're, we have the worst situation in California. New York's pretty bad. Um, we have a really powerful teachers' union that doesn't seem to be looking out for the kids. 
looks out for the teachers, which is really, I guess, its job. So there is a structural problem in education. I think the education system will either improve itself or fall under its own weight so that um, education will change in, a, in an entirely different way. We've got these great uh, uh, tablets, and, and these tablets are like the best possible thing for education. And kids can learn on the tablets. They can, they can get video on the tablets. They can do math problems. They can do anything on these tablets. And you can have the best teacher who, knows the, who does the best job at long division uh, teaching. And the kids can just see that teacher on the, on the tablet for 50 years, get it. And then their, their, their union teacher can just sort of come by and be more of a babysitter, tutor kind of person. And I think uh, that's kind of where we're headed. Because uh, unless the teachers' unions allow real competition in the classroom, competition amongst schools, you're never going to see um, education improve on itself. Um, I'm also uh, starting a school for entrepreneurs, uh, which is uh, great fun, and, uh, and, there, and I have, a, I have a, a, another agenda there, and that is these are going to be 19 to 24-year-olds, which is just the hot spot for great entrepreneurs, and so we're going to have a relatively inexpensive school. They're going to do some outrageous things, and then they're going to go out and start businesses, and we're going to have this incredible network that comes through this school. We're going to have it online and offline. So um, that's kind of a fun. Uh, Draper University. <laughs> I, I couldn't come up with another name. What was <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I had a question. Um, in, in, if, the, if the venture world comes back in a big way, as you predict, is that going to become the, is that going to be because there's going to be a better rate of success with companies uh, that are venture backed, or is it become that, or is it going to be because the success for each company that does succeed uh, is all that greater? Um, that's a really tough question. Um, I think it's because, I think um, that we are going to see uh, quite a big boom in, in venture capital because you're going to see Facebook go out and people say, oh, I guess you can still make money in, in venture capital. And then you'll see a few others go out. And then maybe some will, will list on expert and others. Um, I actually think that if you have a really big revolutionary idea, and it's software on a cell phone, it can spread really fast. So you can get to be worth a billion dollars or $10 billion in a much faster time than you ever could before. So I think it's going to be um, more fleet of foot. And as venture capitalists, we're going to have to swallow our pride because we are not going to get every deal. Uh, but as long as we spread it wide enough, we're going to get enough so that your returns end up being much, much bigger than they would be if you just put it in the bank, which basically means I will, I will beat 1%. <laughs> No guarantee there, but you know, I think we can do it. Yeah. <clears throat> What's your view of the fintech space? And uh, why are we still generating electricity, <coughs> the vast majority of our electricity, the way we did 100 years ago? Why hasn't that changed? Um, well, it's very interesting. What, what do I think of the clean tech space? And then why are we generating electricity pretty much the same way we were 100 years ago? Um, what's interesting is I have run into a few entrepreneurs who are way out there who have completely new ways of generating electricity that just would boggle your mind. And they say that, that Maxwell's laws are all wrong, and they, they've got a whole new way of looking at uh, electricity and how we can somehow get it just from the earth itself. Uh, that's one. And another one has a very different approach. Um, so I don't think it's over. I just think <clears throat> we have generally decided that it's cheaper to get our electricity from, from uh, oil, generally. <coughs> but I, I would say that it hasn't been that it hasn't changed at all. Um, Enernoc uh, has uh, pioneered the smart grid. 
And that smart grid has made it so that uh, we use a lot less uh, energy to do the same thing. Battery technology has improved. It kind of goes up about 10% a year, 20% a year. Um, <clears throat> solar is taking a bigger and bigger share. Uh, <clears throat> I think that there are some that are, well, I'll tell you, there's another, another thing that is, a, that is standing in the way of, of technology and advancement in energy, and that is the people who fight against nuclear power Sure, yes, we have had a few meltdowns. People really got hurt in Japan. But in France, they've been running 80, 70 or 80 percent nuclear power for uh, 25 years. And there hasn't been an incident at all, knock on wood. Um, so I, I think that you know these guys who carry around sticks saying no nukes, they, they they're not sure if they mean power or no nuclear weapons or no nuke whatever, but they're just fighting against whatever. And, and that means that it makes it, I've looked at some of these small nuclear power companies. It's 15 years before you, you put the first shovel in the ground. And, uh, and what that means is, and it's been 25 years since one has been built in the US. So all of the nuclear power engineers are from the US are now like in their 70s. And if we started one, they would be in their 95s uh, to, to get it done. So we really need to revamp that because it works. It is the cleanest, the cheapest. It's the best energy out there. And I don't know why, you know, it, it's, a, it's like the third rail of government. They don't want to touch it, but they should. There are a few very brave politicians or extraordinarily popular politicians who will say they're for more nuclear power, but we also, you know, we also can drill. There, there's an awful lot more oil down there, but, uh, you know, in Alaska and Texas and all over California, wherever, and it's not being drilled, but um, there are a lot of environmentalists out there that like their beach or they like their snow or whatever. Um, so <clears throat> there are a lot of interesting things. Investing in clean technology for venture capitalists is a tough game. It's better to invest just um, in really novel ideas as a venture capitalist because a lot of these become very capital intensive later and they really are the job of a private equity group or something like that. Probably, okay, great, I'm getting the hook. Very nice to talk to all of you. Thank you for staying as long as you did.